Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome, and thank you so much for coming out today to see this new short film by Robert Greenwald and join our discussion here at Pace University. My name is Lynn Paramore, and I write about culture and economics for Reuters and Al Jazeera America and others. And we're here today to talk about a subject that could not possibly uh, be more important to our society, and that is widening income inequality. Uh, I think we all realize that something doesn't add up when 25 of the top hedge fund managers in America make more than every single kindergarten teacher. So we're here to find out how this happened and what we can do about it. And it's also my distinct pleasure to introduce a leader who has done much more than pay lip service to this issue. He made it the central focus of his campaign in 2013, and it is also central to the work of his current administration. He is really using the power of city government to make sure that uh, New York is a place where everyone can succeed. Um, and he has been working on inequality in areas like education and criminal justice and workers' rights. And he's also doing a lot to keep this topic uh, front and center on the national stage. And I am, of course, talking about the mayor of New York City, Please join me in giving a very warm welcome to the Honorable Bill de Blasio. Thank you. Thank you so much, Lynn. Lynn, thank you for calling me Honorable. That meant a lot to me. Thank you, everyone. Lynn, thanks for leading us today. I want to thank everyone for being here and being a part of this discussion today. And it literally, as Lynn said, could not be on a more important topic. I want to thank Pace University for hosting us. I want to thank the wonderful folks at Brave New Films. You'll see their handiwork in a moment, but they do extraordinary work illuminating the issues of the day. Uh, we have some members of my team here today, including our commissioner for the mayor's office uh, for people with disabilities, Victor Calise, Pauline Toole, our commissioner for the Doris office, and Lori Sutton our Commissioner of the Mayor's Office of Veterans Affairs, and I want you to thank all of them for being here, and Councilmember Corey Johnson, a great progressive in the City Council. Let's thank all of them for what they do. Uh, Brave New Films does amazing work. They have a board member who I think the world of because she helps to foster some of the most important progressive coverage and discussion in this country. I am speaking of Katrina Vanden Heuvel, the editor of The Nation magazine. 150 years The Nation has been illuminating key issues, including inequality. And let's thank Katrina for the great work that she does. We are going to hear from Robert Greenwald in a moment, the director of this film, who has an amazing career. And we're also going to hear from someone who can speak with real authority on the topic before you, a New York City kindergarten teacher, Lena Lombardi, who just started school yesterday. And uh, you're going to hear why this stark contrast between 25 hedge fund managers and 150,000 plus kindergarten teachers around our nation really should tell us all we need to know about the challenge of inequality in our times. And the solution we're talking about today is one that is straightforward and gaining currency more and more, literally, it seems, every day. Now, let me just ground this for a moment in the experience we're having here in New York City. Look, uh, I ran on a pledge of addressing income inequality. I talked about the tale of two cities that New York City has experienced for years, and this country has increasingly experienced, where we see growing inequality and the corrosive impact of it. And you know, when you talk about inequality, it's not an abstraction. It's not um, a matter of philosophy to say, wouldn't we like more equality versus less? No, it's something much more tangible. Growing inequality undermines our cohesion as a nation. It literally takes away the opportunities and the possibilities of our people. This nation has been strongest and most unified when there was opportunity for more and more people. We've seen that possibility narrow in recent years, the exact opposite of what should be happening. You know, I like to quote different folks across the spectrum on these issues because it's not just progressives talking about it. One of the most powerful statements I heard in the last year on income inequality was 
by Lloyd Blankfein, the CEO of Goldman Sachs, not a leftist by any measure. And he said growing income inequality was destabilizing the United States of America. A very powerful choice of words, but a very apt one. So we said here in this city, we have to use every tool possible to address it. And I'll tell you, I think we're making some headway, but, but I always said any one city can only go so far. The real big solutions are to some extent in our state capitals, but most especially in Washington, D.C. The biggest, most high-impact actions can only be taken by our federal government. And that's why this film, putting this into such stark contrast, is a wonderful call to arms to people all around the country to recognize we have to change federal policies fundamentally. Now, in the city, look, again, everything we could find to help fight inequality, we are using. We got paid sick leave to a half million more people. We, for the first time ever, had a rent freeze for over a million New Yorkers who were living in rent-regulated units and had seen their rents go up unfairly over the years. They finally got some relief from that. We are creating an affordable housing plan, 200,000 units preserved and built over the next 10 years, enough for half a million people. You'd think about things like that. You think about this wonderful step forward we made yesterday, pre-K, universal pre-K, full day for every child in our city. 65,000 kids started pre-K in New York City yesterday. Full day pre-K. So you think about these very big investments, these very big changes, and you say, well, wow, that's, that's a lot that's going to add up. It does help. It helps a lot. It helps that we have an aggressive living wage executive order and we're expanding it to more and more people. All these things help. But the big holistic solutions come from changing federal policies, from making investments in our people, from progressive taxation that would actually give government the resources it needs to address these problems on a much greater level. So I'm proud of what we're doing here. But the real challenge for all of us is to take all the great examples from cities and states around the country and use them to create pressure on Washington for change and to bind together so many kindred voices who believe in fairness. That's why I joined with others back in May to create the Progressive Agenda. The Progressive Agenda is a gathering of leaders of all stripes from around the country who believe in things like closing the carried interest loophole or making $15 the national minimum wage or pre-K for all all over this country, core concepts that really would get to the heart of the matter when it comes to income inequality. I will just take a moment for a plug. If you're interested in the Progressive Agenda, try progressiveagenda.us and you'll get all the facts. <laughs> but uh, you can clap for that. <laughs> but let me tell you, um, at this moment where New York City has embarked on something absolutely wonderful, and our pre-K effort is every neighborhood, it's every kind of person, every walk of life, and I've heard from parents what it means for them, it's a reminder that when you have the resources, we can do things that change people's lives. Pre-K is an example. Pre-K would cost $10,000, $15,000 for a parent uh, to get if they had to go out and get a seat at a uh, local nonprofit or a local school. How many parents in the city have $10,000 or $15,000 to spare when so many people are having trouble making ends meet? So that's something the public sector should cover. That's something the city should cover. That's something that should be covered all over the nation as a fundamental need of the people. Pre-K should be the norm, but how do you pay for it? Well, this film's about to give you a simple suggestion that could pay for something like pre-K for all or could pay for some of the other crucial investments we need to make as a nation. It's very simple. When we say close the carried interest loophole, now I must admit, this film is going to make it as sexy as it gets because it is not the sexiest topic. But Robert did a great job with his team breaking it down and making it straightforward and basically explaining that, unshockingly, some very, very privileged people got themselves a special tax consideration that meant they spent less in tax dollars, they had to pay less in taxes, uh, than other people who should bluntly be held to the same standard. So what happened is some very privileged people paid a lower tax rate and pay today a lower tax rate than all the rest of us who work. 
because they make their money through hedge funds. Now, I think the American sense of fairness is that however you make your money, you should pay a fair level of taxes so we can support all the work we have to do on behalf of our whole society and all our people. And Lord knows there shouldn't be special breaks for those who have the most. You know, I, I invoked Lloyd Blankfein before. Let me talk about Warren Buffett, who said when he talked about the, the Buffett rule that no millionaire should pay less in taxes than his own secretary. He shouldn't pay a lower tax rate than his own secretary. Well, here's another example of that. Why should there be a special loophole allowing hedge fund managers to pay a lower tax rate than working people? It makes no sense. And what it means is resources that could go to making this a better country simply aren't available. Because these folks who have done fabulously well aren't paying their fair share. I'll do the Warren Buffett equivalent here. You're going to see some examples of these well-known hedge fund managers in this film. And I will say it this way. They pay a lower tax rate than the woman who cleans their summer house or the guy who flies their private jet. That's what's going on here, and it doesn't make sense, and it doesn't conform to our values as Americans, and it has to change. Now, we have a moment where this discussion has suddenly gotten very ripe and very powerful, because the public can understand if you had billions of dollars, you could invest in pre-K or kindergarten or so many other good causes, good, powerful things that our people need. Well, who wouldn't want to see both the fairness and those resources brought to bear to help working people and their families. So there's something going on here that's causing people to pay a lot more attention. And all over this country, the discussion about income inequality is getting more and more powerful, and it's being brought forward to candidates for office and to people in office. The demand is being put on them to address income inequality, to talk about tax fairness, and say what they would do. Now, you might say, well, wait, sure, there are some progressives, who might respond to that, but a lot of other people, a lot of other candidates, maybe more conservative folks, would turn away and not even want to talk about the issue. Well, just when you thought things were really black and white, very interesting few developments in our nation in the last couple of weeks. Uh, I must admit, I did a double take when I saw Donald Trump speaking out for closing the carried interest loophole. That was not in the Donald Trump lexicon I was used to. But he did it, I'll give him credit, he did it with passion. And he pointed out that it just didn't make sense that this small group of individuals paid a lower tax rate. Well, okay, you could say Donald Trump, you know, he's, he's known to be a bit controversial. We're glad it was good controversy in this case. But then you wake up today and you see Jeb Bush calling for an end to the carried interest loophole. So once in a while it might be possible to imagine that fairness breaks through, that the light breaks through, and a basic matter of what's right comes to the fore. And maybe another way to think of it is the demands that the people make actually break through. Because all over this country you hear people demanding more fairness, you hear them demanding more economic equality, you see it in the actions of local governments all over the country, you see it in referenda, even in red states, referenda for higher wages and benefits. So maybe, Donald Trump and Jeb Bush and a lot of other people are finally realizing the people are speaking and they're speaking loudly on this issue. So the call to action in this wonderful film is that every presidential candidate should have to speak up on this issue and every candidate should take a simple pledge that in their first 100 days in office, they will close the carried interest loophole once and for all. But this film will say it much more eloquently than I could, and I want to introduce to you the man who brought it to us. Robert Greenwald is the founder and the president of Brave New Films. Uh, he has won more awards and more different kind of awards for his work in film and TV, for his documentaries than I could possibly name. And what's powerful about Robert is he had a thriving career in the film and TV industry but he felt called more and more to make documentaries that would shed light on the issues we're facing. He was particularly moved by the 2000 presidential election and the fact that the will of the people was not heard. 
and he made a great documentary then, and he's continued since. He has been many times awarded for his work. It's been seen all over the globe. It's been influential for its power, its clarity. He's earned 25 Emmy nominations for all that he has done. A great artist, a great thinker, a great progressive, very proud to say one of the inaugural signatories of our progressive agenda, and someone who really sheds light in a nation that could use some more. Ladies and gentlemen, Robert Greenwald. Strange to be in New York and not be attacked, but thank you for that introduction. I have to adjust. You mean uh, that politically? Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> right, sorry. <laughs> exactly. Sa safest summer in 20 years, Robert. <laughs> <laughs> I walk out at night, during the morning, any time at all, very safe. It's the political attacks. Um, so I want to first thank uh, Pace University and the mayor and the progressive agenda for really leading the fight on this and many other issues. Having a progressive agenda, many of us have talked about, dreamed about, fantasized about it, but it's taken the mayor and his staff to push, to insist, and to bring it into being. And for that, I think we all owe them a big debt. As we're seeing, by the way, a sentence I never thought I would say, following Mayor de Blasio, we now have Trump and Bush on his coattails. So thank you for that. <laughs> So the mayor has been fighting very hard in New York City on inequality and as a, I can't say former New Yorker, I don't live here anymore, but I'm still a New Yorker and uh, you might hear it a little bit in the voice, but each day that I would pick up the paper and see that he was fighting on housing or jobs or school and really fundamentally, fundamentally working to change the power structure and the power dynamics and the the way that the system has worked, I've been cheering loudly uh, from the West Coast. And the fact that he's been doing it and continues to do it gave us this opportunity with this film to work with him, to work with his staff, to work with the progressive agenda, and say, simple, simple fact, this is not right. Who among us doesn't remember or have fond feelings about a kindergarten teacher? for ourselves, for our children, for our grandchildren, for our nieces, for our nephews, and the very notion that these teachers should be underpaid, which we know, but then that they should get taxed more. Just think about this. They are getting taxed more than billionaires, percentage-wise. It's fundamentally obscene. It's fundamentally wrong. And on the backs of these teachers, we should not be allowing these loopholes to continue to exist. But again, the mayor, the progressive agenda, and others are working to change that. What we've done in this film, what we try to do in all of the films that my amazing, amazing colleagues at Brave New Films, our executive director, Jim Miller, is here with us today. Many are in Los Angeles now. We try to put a face on policy. Many of you in the audience here work on policy, write papers, research. Our job is a different one. It's to take that policy and to turn it into a human story so that everybody can understand it, so that we can connect the dots, so that you can see a kindergarten teacher talking and saying, wait, it doesn't make sense that she is or he is taxed more than the hedge fund managers. And we've done it over the years, whether it's Walmart or Coke or the film on drones or the work we're doing on racism or to prison for poverty, taking those stories, sometimes complicated, and in the case of the hedge funds, I think by design, carried interest, what the hell does that mean? It makes no sense. It took us a long time to figure out how to make it simple and clear. This is what it is. They are getting it. The kindergarten teachers are getting screwed and things have to change. So with that, Let's watch the film and then we'll have a discussion. Thank you. Yeah. Broke it down there. Right? <laughs> <laughs> 
people who go into teaching. They want to affect the future, they want to work for the children, they want to go improve life. Like, how can I do the most good? Where would it be? So I decided to go into teaching. I know I'm having a positive impact on their lives. I get a lot of hugs. It's really exciting to see them. I'm excited about learning. We try to make lifelong learners. This is where the joy is. <laughs> The top 25 hedge fund managers made more than all the kindergarten teachers in the country. I'm definitely surprised. I didn't realize it was that much. There's a lot of kindergarten teachers. It's absurd that some people should make that much money. 25 people should not make more than kindergarten teachers. That's ridiculous. That's ridiculous. in order to have a nice functioning classroom in a system that is incredibly underfunded. I have to go buy it out of my pocket. I was forever scoring the Goodwill and yard sales. But teachers can't afford to live in their communities. They can't afford to buy a home. They can't afford to live in our city and be a part of it. I, I don't get by that. I mean, the money that I have, I mean, I'm literally usually like $5, $10 over, over the red every, every month, every month. I generally have to ask for help from my family. You have kindergarten classrooms that are trying to scrape together basic needs to help serve children. And then we have a system based on the priorities for a hedge fund manager to not pay taxes. Hedge fund managers are literally making billions and billions of dollars. And it's crazy that they pay less taxes than the rest of us. So hedge fund managers, because of the carried interest loophole, pay the capital gains rate of 20%. But a kindergarten teacher, he or she is paying 25%. The hedge fund guys, they invented something called carried interest. The carried interest loophole. And it allows hedge fund managers to treat their income as capital gains. Capital gains are the profits that hedge funds or other people make. So if I bought $100 of stock and I sell it for $200, my capital gains is $100. The key thing is I pay a lower tax, 20% on that profit than I would on regular income. They claim that it's supposed to encourage investment and risk, but what's crazy is hedge fund managers aren't investing or risking their own money. They're investing somebody else's money and risking it, and then they're getting a tax break for it. So carried interest is really just a gimmick of the super rich to avoid paying taxes that regular people would have to pay. In theory, some of those loopholes were understandable, but in practice, they sometimes made it possible for millionaires to pay nothing but a bus driver was paying 10% of his salary, and that's crazy. Do you think the millionaire ought to pay more in taxes than the bus driver, or less? Every penny they avoid in tax has to be made up by somebody else who pays more tax, or has to be made up by shutting a school. There's a direct relationship between the money they suck out of the economy into their wallets and what we're not able to provide for our teachers and our children. Taxes for the richest Americans have come down at a continuous clip since the 1960s. But the middle class has been left to pick up the tab. The key thing about carried interest is they're investing other people's money. And the notion that they should get a special tax break for doing their job is crazy. That's ridiculous. The hedge fund guys are getting away with murder. They're making a tremendous amount of money. They have to pay tax. The only reason the carried interest loophole hasn't been closed is because hedge fund managers use their enormous wealth to buy politicians and make sure elections turn out in a way that they're protected. And then I think the really dangerous thing is a revolving door. If you look at where people go after they leave government service, they go to work for hedge funds. And that's one of the reasons why the carried loophole 
is protected because people want to be part of that system when they get out of Washington. Unbelievable and extremely uh, unjust, really. I don't get it. I just, I don't get why we are not out on the streets screaming stop. Closing the carried interest loophole is an easy step to starting to address inequality in this country. There's more of us than them, and it's time that we have a collective voice and actually speak up and change the system. Republicans and Democrats both agree that the notion that 25 hedge fund managers can make, make more money than every kindergarten teacher combined is just crazy. It's just a matter of having the courage to take action and getting rid of it. everyone. I hope you enjoyed that. And uh, if you would write down questions that you may have, uh, these will be collected in the aisle and uh, we will use some of these questions in our discussion. I want to start with one of the questions. Okay. The mayor only has 10 minutes. He's got to leave yeah, for uh, we're, we're what, a little what limited television on thing time. is it? Seth All Myers. Right. Seth Myers. So Seth we have Myers. to wish him luck before. <laughs> Okay, so the question that I have for you, Mayor de Blasio, um, a lot of people argue about what drives income inequality. Liberals say, uh, well, maybe it's because of low wages or uh, weakened unions or high CEO pay. Conservatives tend to point to things like uh, technological change and a perceived lack of skills on the part of workers. Why is this particular driver something that people across the political spectrum, as we've heard, find so unjustified and unfair? I think it's a very powerful question because it's interesting. I've heard that fault line. And I think it's important to look it in the eye. Uh, no one that I know, I certainly don't believe that technological change has nothing to do with this or globalization has nothing to do with this. I think, I believe the, the mature approach is to say, look, a lot of different things have come together. But the fact that technological change or globalization are contributing factors does not, uh, in a sense, excuse the other realities. Uh, globalization and technological change emanated, in many cases, from governmental policies uh, that were not necessarily just to begin with. And we certainly see a lot of that playing out in the debate over trade right now. Are we going to have policies that encourage further globalization and further dumbing down of wages and benefits uh, and less power in the hands of people and more power in the hands of corporations. So I, I think even if you say there's something analytically important to acknowledge about historical trends, that does not for a moment take away the fact that a lot of them were grounded in policies that favored those who already had power. I think the other side of, the, of your question is crucial here. Um, we in this country once tax the wealthy at a much higher level. And it had great uh, impact on our society as a whole during the Eisenhower administration. So just to ground this, we're not talking about Che Guevara here. During the Eisenhower administration, uh, wealthy people were taxed at a much higher rate. It was one of the realities that allowed us to invest in infrastructure, invest in research, invest in education. There's a cause and effect here. The union movement was much stronger, obviously, for most of a half century, say from the 30s through the 70s and 80s. Uh, and that kept bringing up the middle class, bringing up wages and benefits. There was an assumption through much of government that government actually had to constantly reinforce the standard living of our people and open up more opportunity for working people and for people who had been historically left out of the economy. So, What's so interesting in this discussion is we have a body of evidence of what worked. I'm not saying it was a perfect, gauzy time. As my wife, Shirlane, always reminds me, the good old days were not the good old days for a lot of people. But there were some real specific, better elements of our society, including the level of investment our government made, the way we 
asked those who had done very well to pay their fair share, and a fundamental belief that government was supposed to work to improve wages and benefits across the board. Those are the things we have to get back to. Uh, thank you very much. And I'll just ask you one final question because I, I know your time is limited. Um, what do we stand to lose as a society if we are not able to change these policies um, like carried interest? What, how is it going to change us? I, I appreciate that question deeply. And one, I, I point to the destabilization point again, the quote from Lloyd Blankfein. Again, this is, we're not going to succeed as a nation, as a people if there is not opportunity. In fact, if you can see before your eyes opportunity shrinking and more and more people unable to make ends meet. And Robert, I give you such credit for the stories you told even so briefly in the film, but these teachers who are giving their all, and particularly the one who said, you know, at the end of the month, she was in debt $5, $10, like that's the, the thin margin that so many Americans are living on. So you look at that, and you say, how could that be a strong and stable country? How could that be the right direction? And honestly, even the most recent economic data proves that unfortunately, working people continue to go backwards in real economic terms. It's not like you know, the quote unquote recovery has suddenly righted the ship and prosperity is being shared. And even years after the Great Recession, so many working people continue to go in the wrong direction economically. So I think we have to think on the one hand about the destabilization element. The second part of the equation is what we're losing because we're not investing. So go all around the country, go all around our city. Uh, we're not investing in infrastructure because the resources aren't there. The resources aren't there in part because we're not asking those who have done so well to pay their fair share. If we're not investing in infrastructure, we're actually stymieing our economic possibilities and our future growth possibilities. We're also not providing a lot of jobs that would be provided if we were building. And that's what we did for decades. And a lot of people uh, were able to feed their families because they had those jobs. We're not investing the way we could in education. We're thrilled that we got to full day pre-K for all in New York City, but let's face it, we're a rarity. Uh, in many, many cities and states, uh, full day pre-K, even part day, pre half day pre-K is not available. So kids aren't getting the education they need to be competitive in the world and to have the futures they could have. So you look at what's been lost because the dynamic in Washington has devolved down to how can we avoid spending money? And how can we avoid asking people to give their fair share for the good of all? It's stymieing us as a country. And if you, as a New Yorker, anywhere you come from, you feel quality of life in terms of things like infrastructure getting worse, there's a literal cause and effect, and Robert's pointed out in the film, there's a literal cause and effect between the wrong kind of taxation policies and what we're not able to do for the good of all. With that, I want to thank the panel. Forgive me that I, I have to move on, but I just want to ask one thing, if I may. I, I really think it's important that we not only thank all the panel, but thank everyone at Brave New Films, because this is a powerful work of art. Thank you so much, Robert. Let's give them another round of applause. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, and thank you for giving us momentum on this topic. Uh, well, uh, so now we have with us uh, Robert Greenwald, you've already met, and we also have um, another guest, and she is Lena Lombardi, and she has been a uh, gifted and talented uh, education teacher for six years at PS 132, five of those years teaching kindergarten, so um, please welcome her to our conversation. <laughs> you. Okay, so I've got some questions from, from the audience here. And uh, either one of you can answer as, uh, as you see fit. Eliminating the carried interest loophole will raise more revenue for governments, but that doesn't put more pay in teachers' pockets. How does closing this loophole reduce income inequality? Well, I think, um, you know, one of the things that is so important to recognize is that when you go into the teaching profession, we go into it to affect lives, and you go into it with the understanding that the job you're doing every day really does have the potential to affect change, and you don't do it to become rich. Nobody, I mean, let's face it, nobody becomes a teacher because they think they're gonna be rich. Um, you do it because at the end of the day, what you do matters, 
um, and you do it because you hope that whatever it is that you're building in your day-to-day -day profession and what it is that you're molding and helping these children grow into will essentially be something that can speak to the future and speak to the well-being of the future. So I don't think it's necessarily about putting more money in teachers' pockets. I mean, although I don't think anyone would object to that, but I don't think it's necessarily about raising our salary and saying, you know, you're making this much, we're making this one, why is that? I think what people don't necessarily realize is that it's not just about teachers saying, we need more money. It's about the resources that it takes to make a school function properly and to give the students the education that they really need. So it has nothing to do with increasing teacher salaries so much as it has to do with allocating the funds that would be generated from closing the loophole mm -hmm. um, and allocating those funds so that they can be used for resources within the school, and both tangible and otherwise. I think that it's really important to recognize that resources in schools don't only necessarily mean supplies. Um, there are many forms of resources that are, that go into a good education and that go into meeting the needs of the diverse group of students that we have, specifically in the New York City schools and even beyond. You know, you need mental health professionals. You need a sufficient staff to be able to, to be there for the students. You need, um, obviously, supplies, tangible resources as well. You need RTI response to intervention specialists for the students that maybe need a little extra support and need to be pulled from the classroom environment so that the other students aren't suffering as a result of it. So I think that, that there's a lot that goes into making a well-rounded education a possibility for every student. Mm. And I think that closing the carried interest loophole will generate the funds necessary to do that without necessarily you know, speaking specifically to teacher salary, but just to resources in general and the availability of those funds to our students and to the children. Thank you, that, that really sense. gives a holistic picture of what's going on here. Thank you very much. Another question, uh, Robert, maybe this is one for you, uh, touches on your work as an activist. Is direct action more productive than lobbying politicians? <clears throat> uh, if I had the answer to that question. Um, you know, it depends on what your belief system is. I'm of the it takes a village school. So I think social movements are critically important. If you look at the, some of the most significant changes over the last 20, 30, 40, 50 years, peace movement, women's movement, civil rights movement, labor movement, they did not sit around and say, we will wait and lobby or wait and find the exact perfect candidate. So they went and had a real significant impact. And you also need elected officials who will be responsive to the movement and who you can lobby. So I would say both things. Um, are important. I am personally in the belief of the social movement first, which would be the power and the energy and the organizing that then leads to some of the wonderful politicians taking the actions we want. Okay, great. This one is uh, directed to the teacher. How often do you have to spend your own money on classroom supplies? Oh my goodness. Um, I, I would say every single year, wow. um, several times a year. And you know, it's, it's something that we do because it needs to be done. You, you have a focus as a teacher to help these students and you, you take an oath, you know, it's not a formal oath that other professions may take in the medical profession or otherwise, but it's an oath that you take to yourself to say, I'm gonna be the best educator that I can and I'm gonna do what I have to do to make sure that these children have what they need to be prepared for the next grade, specifically in terms of kindergarten because prior to this year, you were getting them almost from the ground up. Um, for many of them, it was their first exposure to school to begin with. So as a kindergarten teacher, you're responsible for laying the groundwork and building that foundation. And that's something that is either going to help them excel as they move through the grades, or it's something that if it's not done well and not done properly, is going to cause them to ultimately fail because then they're just playing a game of catch up for the rest of the years, um, which is not fair to them. It's not fair to the teachers responsible for them. And it's not, it, it's, it's just unthinkable. So I think that at the end of the day, we do what we need to do to make sure that the kids get what they need. Amazing. So. <laughs> An amazing thinking of how teachers have been demonized uh, for <laughs> wanting to get rich off of this process. Yes. Uh, here we have sort of a philosophical question. Is the right to private property and to make a profit absolute? Um, if so, how is social equity not subordinate, therefore? Is it not how profit equity 
Oh, I'm having trouble reading somebody's handwriting, but I think we get the gist of that. Is uh, this is about the right to private property and making a profit? Um, is you know, is it okay that these people are um, making profits a as uh, hedge fund managers and able to keep it? Sure. Yeah. I think that in any society that the focus is on the entire society and everybody in the society, in the culture, in the country. One wants to strive for a system and a way of working and a set of laws and behavior that treats not just the individual, sometimes known as, known as greed, but looks at the larger picture. And towards that end, what we're seeing now, again, think about it for a, million, a moment, billionaires, billionaires, fighting to keep every nickel, which they don't need, their children don't need, their great-great-grandchildren don't need, versus where and how that money could be used for the greater good. Yeah, and just to, to piggyback off of um, what Robert said, I think that it's, I just, I wanna be clear here because I feel like as, as having this opportunity to, to be able to kind of share a teacher's perspective on it, I, I don't think the issue is or ever was that there's an, a problem with these executives or these managers being profitable. I mean, at the end of the day, that's, that's what we're, we're here for. You know, we, we strive for success and profit is part of success in, in a, lot, a lot of cases. So I don't think the issue is that they're not, that they are profitable and that that's what we take issue with, but it's the idea that because they are so profitable, they have a certain obligation, I think, to our society to pay their fair share. You know, and what's baffling to me as an educator is that we have come so far as a society in terms of understanding and recognizing how what we do today affects future generations. And we have become so aware of that. You know, we see that with, with all these go green efforts that we're looking at and our care for the environment and preserving resources for these future generations. And we accept that we have a responsibility to the future generations with things like that. But that same mentality doesn't trickle down to education and that's baffling to me. Okay, so. uh, I've, got, I've got two more questions here. What specifically would you like to do with $17.7 .7 billion gained from closing the carried interest loophole? No, you, you yes, the, oh my goodness. <laughs> um, I mean, th oh my goodness, that is such an overwhelming number. <laughs> I don't think I could even wrap my head around that much money. Um, but I, I mean, there is so much, there's so much that we could do. As I mentioned earlier, the, the amount of resources that could be allocated to different classrooms and programs um, to, to help students, you could physically put more, more physical bodies in, in schools and hire more staff, give them more resources for pull-out services as well as, as um, you know, push-in services for the students. You can obviously prevent teachers from having to go out and buy supplies and also therefore limiting themselves because they themselves only have a certain amount of money they can spend. Um, the, they can actually purchase the items that they need in order to give these students an education. Um, I mean, there's just, I mean, the possibilities are infinite. It's, it's an overwhelming amount of money, <laughs> it really is. Okay, uh, final question. I'm, I'm gonna sort of summarize this one. Uh, this has to do with, we've been talking about Jeb Bush and Donald Trump. Uh, do we really believe that <laughs> it would be a good thing to have them in office? We remember the compassionate conservatism of Big Brother George. I guess, you know, the question, are, are these people really sincere? Um, no, I don't think it would be a good thing to have them in office. It would be a terrible thing to have them in office. I'm very, I'm very glad that Trump, in his nuanced, carefully thought out way, is uh, attacking the hedge fund guys, as only he can say, as he said, they're guilty of murder, I think was his quote, which is, if any liberal or progressive said that, we'd be brutally attacked by um, all kinds of of people, and also to be clear on Jeb Bush, for example, and there's a very good New York Times piece about it today, yes, and it's very good that he has called for the ending of carried interest, but he is giving back to those guys many, many, many times over if you dig through the rest of the plan or if you read the summary of the New York Times. So in terms of inequality, it would be a significant disaster for our country if either of those are elected president. Okay. Thank you very much, everyone, for being here. And um, thank you for those provocative questions. And thank you, Robert, and very much thank you, Lena, for the work that you're thank doing you so and for helping us understand this issue. Yes, thank, thank you. you.